name is Andrew Frank, working as a consultant with the uh, road safety issues, uh, um, escape uh, issues, just like the time we talked about in Stockholm for big infrastructure projects like tunnels in Stockholm and Sweden. And it's uh, interesting what you talked about just now. Um, I wonder what your view is when it regards these, what you just presented, um, when it comes to um, people driving traffic uh, who experience uh, both that there is a threat and those who don't experience any threat at all but still need to evacuate. Um, because um, I suppose that all these, these evacuation um, doors and escape routes are, uh, if someone is looking for someone to escape, it's much easier to fulfill this. But if they are feel very safe in their cars, how will you get them out of the car and understanding that they need to go to this place? Well, it's, it's, uh, not sure, is this on? No. Uh, I think it's definitely a, a problem, I would say. And, and that's one of the challenges we have. How do we, do we get people to leave their, uh, leave their vehicles? Uh, and I think the only way is to, to uh, provide them with clear information <laughs> of what is happening. Give them the cues necessary. But the, I, I do not have an answer to how much do we need to provide them with. Um, since I know from previous tunnel accidents that people often stay in their vehicles. But if the traffic is standing still, if you get the clear information uh, and you at least get a couple of people to respond, then the social influence has a very strong effect. So it's all about getting the few to respond and then the rest will follow. But there is no, I, I wouldn't say there's a standard solution for all tunnel types for how to design it. You need to test these systems to be sure that the correct information is conveyed so that people will escape. Um, and you need, as you say, there are two different situations, but in tunnels you need people to evacuate when there is no danger. Since when there is danger it's too late and you cannot find your way out. So you need to work on that. But from the Yota tunnel, and Lena could perhaps also fill in uh, a bit, the, the information they got there, which was an information message, uh, so spoken information message and alarm signal in the tunnel, plus information on the signs, plus an additional flashing light at the exit, that seemed to be sufficient for them to, to leave their vehicle. Um, but, as I say, it's an experiment. It's associated with limitations. I don't know if you have yeah. anything to add. We can, uh, uh, Daniel showed uh, the flashing lights and how they attracted the, uh, the driver's attention, but the, the one very powerful cue in this experiment was that, you know, once one person started uh, leaving the car, the others would follow. So this is, the social uh, cues are very, very powerful. So, so as, a, as a suggestion for a measure, for example, you should, in certain environments, you could actually train certain key, uh, key groups of professionals, like professional drivers, you know, and then they would know how to behave, and then they can, you know, in the, by, by showing how, how to, to behave in a safe way, they can actually help. I think, yeah. so, so, so this is, um, well, technology <coughs> is uh, not the solution. And I agree with Lena, what we've seen in, in studies is that the social influence is very important. If you get someone to start to evacuate, you can often get other people to do it as well. And many of the people, like in the Yota Tunnel, the first couple of people to respond saw a lot. The others saw other people doing something, and they followed. And this has implications for training. Uh, how should we train people? Should we train everyone, but not very well? Or should we train few, and very well? So that you have at least 10% or 5% always responding, or should you train everyone less and maybe no one is responding? So, and those are the types of questions we need to ask ourselves. Could I? And this is, uh, of course, the social uh, influence and the, the how people behave in groups is, of course, as, uh, in, as in, uh, in this case, they promote the, a very positive safety behavior, but you know, if you have in a railway situation where there, somebody starts to leave the, the train, 
without uh, the without an authorization by the, the the staff and others will also follow and then they will actually direct others to a very unsafe behavior so that is yeah that is the other side of this so so this is uh, but it's very powerful i should say yes. so. any other questions yeah uh, yes i'm working in um, in France about evacuation in general, so, so I have a question about the last presentation. Um, it's, um, I, I've asked him, maybe I didn't understand everything, but um, you have shown us a system with the two lights around the, the, the sign, this one, and when you speak about the test uh, the, in the field, it's not the same system, it, even if it's flashing and green, so I don't understand why and why change the, the test or why choose yeah. this new website? Well, the, I mean, it is a bit different. The one I'm, I'm using here, I use for illustrative mm. purposes uh, to make it clearer. Uh, the, the essence is the green flashing light next to the sign. Mm. Uh, and, and that you place it close enough to the sign so that it attracts attention to the sign, thereby conveying a message since it's green so you understand that it's safety, go, it's okay to use it. If you would use red, it would get discourage people. Uh, and also the location next to the sign, since you get attraction, attention to the sign, which conveys also a message. Uh, but it's not, I mean, this was for illustrating it, uh, but it, it, the essence is the green flashing light next to the sign, which is a relatively simple system, I must say, but the, the other systems we tested, like the, the traveling light sources, they were too complex for people to understand in that stressful situation. So I think if we're going to use these types of systems, they have to be relatively simple and easily understood. Yes, uh, I'm Anders Stenhansen from uh, Sinte van Del in Norway. And it's a very interesting discussion and very interesting presentation. So I also have a, a question to this uh, flashing uh, sign. Uh, did you consider the height of or the position uh, of, of the flashing? Because I, I saw in, in the movie you showed from, from the evacuation uh, uh, test that the lady was looking downwards and she only oc occasionally looked upwards. And also you can have smoke filling that is uh, obscuring the, the light. So have you considered that? Have you tested that? It is, it is nothing we've tested in these experiments. But as I say, there is the iterative loop. And you can test one design. Um, the problem I see with having sort of low location of the lighting is that uh, you have to... Well, the, the reason this works as effectively as it does, I believe, is the location close to the sign. So unless you have a sign at low level, I don't think you would get the same effect, since you have the cognitive aspect of understanding. Uh, but I, you, you are correct, you need some type of wayfinding system at low levels as well. Yeah, you could just only apply a sign at, at a low level as well. Mm. Well, you could, and, and uh, I think the recommendation is actually to have it on the door as well. The one sign on the door, one sign up high, according to Swedish recommendations. But as I say, it's, I mean, there are one million or so designs, or even more. Uh, most of them don't, don't work, but there is like 10,000 that will work. So you can always tweak it, and you can always design it in one way or another. The, the important thing is to find a design that, that works, uh, and that is not misinterpreted, at least. But as I said, this is a, the iterative loop, and some of the problems we discovered was light intensity, light frequency, so the frequency of flashing. Some frequency might signal keep away, other frequencies of flashing might signal more calm, calm this way. So there are many aspects still that need to be refined, and maybe one of those could be the location. Uh, but it's not something that we looked at. Also a question for Daniel. Um, could you comment maybe on if it is necessary to reevaluate working existing designs? Because I remember from a field study in a lot we did with one participant who was looking at the um, emergency signage and touching it 
and later said that he thought it was something like an iPad. So do you think it is necessary to reevaluate um, these systems? I definitely think. I think there are many <coughs> systems out there um, used in buildings today that simply don't work as intended. Uh, another area which isn't really tunnels perhaps, as it's been mentioned at the conference, is the refuge areas in buildings. Um, you mm -hmm. often, you have requirements of how that, sh what that should look like. Uh, and often you, as an engineer or a designer, you think about it and what's practical and I'll do this and, and you do a design based on what you think people will, how they will interpret it. And one way to mark that off in Swedish buildings is to put tape on the floor where the wheelchair should be. So if, you, if it's in a, in the, on the landing of a building, you tape it off with tape and you have some type of two-way communication. But how is that perceived in, in the eyes of someone in a wheelchair? You come up, you go out into the landing and there's tape and you're thinking, how will the tape protect me from fire? I mean, it's a bit exaggerated, but, but I'm supposed to stand here and I'm safe and everyone else is walking past me. So there are many of those solutions that I, I think simply will not work and we need to look at them, re-examine them and find out how we communicate to the people what, that they're safe in this location or that they should use this exit. And the only way to do this is to test it, expose that population to that system. And now the, the, the approach I suggested is, is relatively ambitious and in most if you're doing a design in a building, I don't think you have the funding to do it all. But if you at least could have, if, you, if you're doing a refuge area for people with disabilities, at least contact the disability rights organization, have people come and look at your different system designs and give you some feedback. I mean, that's the first step. Unless you've done that, I think it will not be a correct design. I have a question for the second presenter. Um, I think you, you had some really interesting results um, from um, the time, time from the train stop to the, uh, the start of the evacuation, where you, you, uh, you found out that in, in all cases, between 10 minutes and, and, and up to 4 hours, more than 60% of cases was more than 30 minutes. So even though this was the, in a situation without immediate threat, um, in, in an actual fire case, as long as the people uh, don't get the cues, it, that would be their perce perceived uh, risk, would be uh, uh, that there is no, no threat. So, does that mean, as, as a designer, when we, when we uh, use a, a pre evacuation time uh, in, in, our, in our analysis, we should, we should be looking at, at uh, uh, 30 minutes pre evacuation time in, in, a, in a, a tunnel fire for? for uh, and, and do you have uh, some, some insight in, in how this pre-evacuation time could be affected by, by uh, different uh, systems? I think that's a very interesting question and uh, I mean of course 30 minutes would be very good to have but I, I don't think that's realistic is it? I mean if you have a... So uh, um, I mean and the, the pre-evacuation time I mean we, we, this is what we've talked about here all along in the discussion and, and uh, this is the key you know this is how to make the people to, to get the cues so uh, so visible and so so uh, well clear that people take the decision to evacuate but then of course in a in a rail environment you will have to arrange for the evacuation you will have to turn off the electricity and you will have to turn off the traffic on the adjacent tracks and uh, this uh, will take time, yes. So that will have to be considered in your, uh, in your design, actually. So, um, yeah. Uh, there are lots of things you can say about the pre-evacuation mm -hmm. times, but uh, of course, I mean, this is, this is the key, you know. Uh, once people make, people are, you know, they set their own goals for what they want to achieve, and uh, when you are on a train, you want to get to work, or you want to get, and there is no, there's no goal in sitting on the train. That is a means to achieve some other goal. And that is what actually directs your behavior. So you have to change that by, by making people focus on the, the right goals in, in different situations. I think we have time for one final or two questions. Then. 
Um, I've got a question for the first speaker. Uh, please don't leave uh, The pre-movement curves from, or the pre-movement times from, from the, 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 the ships, were they daytime, nighttime? Um, how, much, how much difference would you expect between those? They were they were daytime. Um, they, they, mm -hmm. The two um, ferry tests that we did between Norway and, and Denmark happened at about 8.30 in the morning. Uh, both trials actually um, on the same leg of the voyage as well. Um, so we sailed from Norway to Denmark back again and then from Norway to Denmark again and we did both trials in the morning. Um, we did that for obvious reasons. We wanted to you know, be able to be sure that we were getting people at approximately the same time, at approximately the same locations on the ship and, and everything. So we determine if we could get repeatability. Um, the cruise ship was also in the morning. It was uh, near the end of breakfast uh, for some of the passengers, but we had quite a few that were in cabins as well. Uh, we, the third ship that we did the testing on, actually, which I didn't present here, we did some tests at, at night, um, but, uh, but again, not in the middle of the night. Um, for ethical reasons, and that's something actually that I, I, I forgot to mention. I jumped in too quickly into the into the start of the presentation, but we um, we received ethics approval from the uh, from the uh, ethics board at the University of Greenwich, and, and one of the things that we, to be quite honest, didn't want to subject people to at least at this time was uh, getting them out of bed at night. Uh, but in previous testing that we had done, we had to deal with uh, some. Well, the crew had to deal with the hysterical passengers who, despite many notifications, the, the drills were semi-unannounced, so they were given information about the drills, um, but weren't told exactly when the drills were going to happen. They, they were just told that a drill would happen during the voyage at some time. Uh, the previous project, we had done the same thing, and the captain had made many announcements, and we had one passenger who became hysterical, basically. and. Uh, um, very nervous about doing the same thing again. <laughs> final, one final question. I'm lucky. <laughs> I'm Mr. Hansen again, and also a question to Robert. You showed that uh, the response times were very significantly different between the passenger ferries and the cruise uh, line. Uh, did you analyze why? Was it because of a different uh, age distribution? distribution among the passenger activities? Uh, no, we, we're, not, we're not exactly sure, to be honest. Um, the, the, the demographics of the passengers were basically the same uh, across all, the, all those, well, both of the ships. The third ship was quite a bit different. Um, but the, the cruise ship, uh, no, the demographics were roughly the same. The, the exercises happened at roughly the same time of day. We're not exactly sure why, to be honest. We, we think that it, it, it could come down to um, something as simple as, as the, the, the reason why the passengers were there. On, on the ferry, they were traveling. It, it was a voyage, and that's it. They were getting from, from Norway to Denmark. Um, on the cruise ship, they were on vacation. And, and you know, it, it could be as simple as that. We're, we're not sure. But the, that's, that's our theory, is that it, it was just the, the type of voyage. So I uh, thank Lena and Bob for uh, their presentation, so thank you very much.